Uh, our next next guest is known as Crease, mm -hmm. the bad guy. Often you can follow him on the Twitter at Martin Cove. He has something like two hundred and I want to say two hundred and fifty credits to his name. If you look, he, he shows up everywhere. You think he's running to Clint Howard at some point? I, 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 we should ask him. We should he, ask him. He, almost the catalog of Clint Howard, but he doesn't have to, he doesn't have to be Clint Howard. So you know he has so he <laughs> that going for him. But Clint, uh, Clint, we'll have you on soon again, brother. Uh, Mr. Cove, thank you for being on, sir. Thank you, thank you. By the way, Clint Howard, I killed him on Gunsmoke in my first year in Hollywood. <laughs> well, who among us? Are we talking hasn't? about the same Clint that was the, is the father of Ron Howard? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, Clint is, no, he's brother, yeah, Ron Howard's brother. Brother, a brother, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I killed him a couple of times in a couple of movies. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. That's, he's, pretty much if Clint Howard's in a movie, you're writing around the death scene. <laughs> But uh, we brought him in and he did a sketch with us where he actually played Susan Wojcicki, the, the CEO of YouTube, because we, we needed an actor. And we're like, Clint, you could do this. So we dressed him up. And uh, I remember directing him. Oh, I got to tell you, Mr. Cup, it was very hard. He was very, uh, it was a very long, arduous process. And I said, this is going to be terrible. And then when I looked at the rushes, I said, this is amazing. This is, he's a guy who really knows how he registers on camera. Um, and I was, that leads into you. You've, you often play the villain, right? This is no secret to you. I know you're a nice... Are are you a nice guy? I should I shouldn't lead the witness. I, I cry at supermarket openings. Okay, okay. <laughs> that might be disturbed. I don't know that that's necessarily nice. <laughs> um, but you seem like but you often play the bad guy. Now you're one of the few guys out there who is disrespectfully like is good looking enough to still play the tough bad guy. You know you're like you're 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 ruggedly tough. And I noticed you have the Clint Eastwood and I don't know if that's, I can't see the one Coburn behind you. Did yeah, you there you go. Oh, there you go. Okay. Did you Six see? dollars and the good, the bad, and the ugly. There you go. Okay. Per Those you are my theme songs. <laughs> yes. Did you set out to do this? Did you say, okay, I think I'm probably going to be able to do the bad guy role really well or did it just happen organically? No, I guess it just happened organically really. I, I, you know, I have a eight month old grandchild and if I don't see him every day, I cry. No. You know, I mean, I just love this baby. But, you know, you're strong featured and you, I love the physical. When I did Gunsmoke in the first year I was in Hollywood, it was heaven because you got a chance to do, you know, work with James Arness and all. And the bottom line is I loved Westerns. But when you're starting out, you do heavies. You just do. Right. I mean, unless you're looking like Gregory Peck, who never did a heavy. Gregory Peck started out with leading men in the late 30s, you know. Yeah. And there's some people that just go right into it. And I didn't, like so many of my you know, good friends. And you just, you know, it's sort of like you, you create a, a staple of those roles. And I think for young actors, bringing up anger and toughness is probably the easiest emotion to call upon. Mm. Because when you're young, you kind of, you know, touching the vulnerability and doing what Mel Gibson does in all his movies. It's and a lot voice harder. So it, um, yeah, and his voice. <laughs> <that's right. laughs> you have no soul. Uh, I always. Yes. Uh, it's the reason I find those so funny is because I always would talk. I, I say to the audience, "Like, oh come on, all of you are judging this guy in a private voicemail, a private argument. You have had that rage, even if internally at some point. Let let you who has not felt that way cast the first stone. Well, let me let me ask you this: You've done so many roles. Is this is the is Crease still the role you think you're most recognized for? Certainly now with Cobra Kai, but is that the one people connect to most? Do you think? Yeah, that, and when I did, I followed up the original Karate Kid with Rambo First Blood Part Two. Yeah. And and I was doing six years on Cagney Lacey. So <clears throat> a lot of them remember that. Oddly enough, many people are big fans of The Last House on the Left, which is a very, very yeah. bizarre cult movie, which was Wes Craven's first film. I personally, you know, don't understand that, but, you know, it was <laughs> <laughs> 1972 and the other one which is a cult movie which also surprises me is one that Stallone and I did you know prior to Rambo which was um Death Race 2000 yes yeah but you wouldn't believe how many people you know just remember those parts and you know you were playing a crazy you were playing a like you say a, a tough guy it was the early parts of your career yeah you know and um and I think that you, you try to graduate. You know, when I did Cagney and Lacey, I, I kind of stopped doing uh, bad guys because I played him as a macho. You know, he, right. he kind of didn't like women being detectives, but he had a lovable quality about him. And I kept trying to graduate into that area. 
and not do any more wise guys and tough guys. I think, I you, think know, you mentioned Last uh, House on the Left. I think that was one of the few mov films that Wes Craven remade himself. I think Wes Craven remade the Wes Craven because there's a recent one. And I don't know yeah. if it was Jennifer Lawrence, but uh, I appreciate your candor with that. You know, C Clint Howard, a good friend of the show, he's on all, has made a living off of cult films. Remember, he was on the show and he goes, you know, some of the trash I've done, is, I mean, it's borderline unwatchable. Because <laughs> he's done so many. He's like, well, who doesn't help a fine line, you know? Um, practically pornography. It's pornography <laughs> of the lazy mind. Um, <laughs> but uh, let, let me ask you this. Have you seen, obviously, because you've been around for so many decades now in the, in the film and entertainment industry, and it's changed. Uh, radically, where we've kind of come full circle. I talked about this before. Remember, they, uh, they used to say, we'll never have, we'll never have the numbers that, you know, we used to have on with Carson. And granted, that's probably true. But then American Idol was 30-something million. They said, we'll never have those numbers again. You know, The Voice was lucky to get maybe 15 million um, because cable became so spread out. But now we're sort of back to a few main networks with YouTube, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon and HBO, and you're getting these numbers. There's a season of a lot more less famous people. Yes, yeah, for a while. there was for a while. But now you've come full circle, and, and Cobra Kai is getting those kinds of numbers that people thought you would never see again. Uh, what's it like to, to, to be a part of that whole transition and back again? Well, as I said earlier, you and I talked, the writing yeah. and the extraction of the great values from Karate Kid. Karate Kid 1 was a religious experience for so many people. You know, you either were bullied in that period of time and you identify with that. You had a love affair that didn't work out as a high school student or you were fish out of water. You know, and most of the people we've experienced have had one of those things going on in their life when they saw Karate Kid. And I think that, you know, the writing that brings in all of the, the, the fantastic values of the movie into the series is what's making the series work. Yeah, because all those all those extractions, the moments, the the feelings, the 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 emotions from the kids of what they're experiencing. Yeah, on the show is what Ralph experienced back in the day of 1983 when we made the movie. Right. So I think it's highly identifiable. They've chosen the right you know the right experiences to recreate on a weekly basis, and that's what's really selling. You know, it's a show that just like Ed Sullivan in, in its day, the family can get around the TV and watch it. Right. And that's the, that's the value. Uh, it's the value. And that's why the numbers are so high. It's a family deal. Yeah. And it's, but it's a family deal 30 years later in a more active way. And, but it really does work. And we talked about this with, just with Ralph. You know, there are, there are some gray areas. There, there, there is some, I, I wouldn't, but I wouldn't say moral ambiguities because there is redemption. That's kind of hard to do, to have a gray area, to have a bit of an anti-hero, but for there to still be moral redemption. Otherwise, you end up with some of the series out there that are just bleak for the sake of bleakness. Um, I don't want to, you know, no spoilers here. The people in the message boards will go absolutely nuts. But uh, you can see at one point, this guy seems like the good guy. Well, then maybe you're not so sure but there is no moral ambiguity about making the right decisions and i think that's why it works i think people are craving that a little bit what i learned from the original karate kid when i was young was that all bad guys had dirt bikes that's what i thought <laughs> when i watched the thing. i was like he has a dirt bike he must be a teenager <laughs> that was a dirty word as a kid but um right. mr mr cope we don't have a, a ton of time here because ralph went over time talk with him being a little bit of a diva uh but where's the best place for people <laughs> to find you and what should people be looking out for next along with cobra kai well, we just did, um, we're, we're doing a little comedy now with um, Barry Bostwick, but primarily we're going off June 8th. I go off to um, Illinois to do a, a very exciting picture about Gettysburg. And there was a character who was 69 years old named John Burns, who in history literally fought in Gettysburg because he lived in Gettysburg and he became a hero and he, he met Lincoln. And it's all, you know, very, it's all nonfiction. Yeah. So it's all brilliant stuff and it's always fun to play someone who's nonfiction. and i believe you said that uh, your son will be acting you've acted in a, quite a few films with your son now so is, that must be nice to be able to pass the torch it's the best you know jesse cove is the best yes. you know he's doing a part in there and we meet on the field of gettysburg and i'm you know a guy who doesn't even have the right musket <laughs> and he gives me you know the bullets and everything circa 19, 18, 19, 1863 yeah because i came out of war in 1812 and they wouldn't let me join so i'm you know, old, too old to fight. But it's really interesting, the values and how it affected the entire city of Gettysburg. The town was enormously affected by, you know, 
every every house was turned into a hospital. One moment for the Confederates, another for the Union soldiers. So it's 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 emotionally very very and historically a very very effective film. Terrific story. I'm look. I'm looking. And I love any historical. Yeah, I'm looking forward yeah, to it. There haven't been as many great Civil War films when you compare it to World War II or the Revolutionary War. Uh, it seems like it's it's a tough one to do sometimes because of obviously kind of the connotations here in the United States. So I'm looking forward to that. Of course, people can follow you at Martin Cove. Mr. Cove, thank you for making time, sir. We appreciate it.